إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Respected viewers, my dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to the 24th episode of our series Mercy to Mankind. In the previous episode, in the 23rd episode and the 22nd episode, we saw briefly about the Battle of Badr, the first encounter which the Muslims had with their arch enemy, the tribe of Quraysh, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted a clear victory to the small group of 300 Muslims who were intending to to raid a caravan of the people of Quraysh but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prepared something greater for them and they ended up facing an army of 1000 strongly equipped warriors of the Quraysh and a fierce battle took place in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a manifest victory to the Muslims and the battle of Badr had its far-reaching consequences this is what we saw in the previous two episodes and the second major encounter the second major facing with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had with the people of quraysh was the battle of uhud the battle of uhud but in between these two major events the battle of badr and the battle of uhud some significant event events did take place and inshallah we shall be looking at some of these events that took place between the battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud. One such significant incident was the invasion of Al-Qudr, the battle of Al-Qudr. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam victoriously returned from Badr, he got the information that the tribe of Banu Salim or Banu Sulaim who were a sub-tribe of the Ghatafan, they are preparing to launch a surprise attack on Medina. Because they thought that the Muslims, though had gained a victory at Badr, but they were severely weakened by the Battle of Badr. And therefore they found this occasion suitable to launch a surprise attack on Medina and to finish off this rising power of Medina. The Prophet wasallam, even before the tribe of Banu Sulaim could execute their plans, the Prophet wasallam, merely a week after arrival from Badr, he set out with his army to the dwellings of the Banu Sulaim tribe. And he arrived at a place known as Al-Qudr, that was the water resource for this tribe of Banu Sulaim. This tribe of Banu Sulaim, as soon as they heard of the arrival of the Prophet wasallam, they scattered. They fled for their lives. They hid in the mountain tops. The Prophet ﷺ camped at this place of Al Qudr. He gained many camels as the war booty, and no clash took place between the Muslims and the enemies. And the Prophet ﷺ, along with his fellow companions, they safely returned to Medina. And they achieved their objective of instilling fear into the hearts of the Banu Sulaim tribe who were intending and looking at Medina in order to launch a surprise attack on Medina. So they instilled fear into the heart of Banu Sulaim tribe so that in future they would never think of committing such a crime, of committing such an act against Medina. This was one of the incidents that took place immediately after the Prophet ﷺ arrived from Badr. Another significant incident a trial for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the attempt that Umar bin Wahab al-Jumahi, a person from the tribe of Quraysh, the attempt he made to assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because we know that the people of Quraysh in the battle of Badr, 
as if they were totally confident that they would be victorious and they would return home in, in the same pride and arrogance with which they had left Makkah. But as we saw and as the incidents and events unfolded, the tribe of Quraysh lost in the battle of Badr and an atmosphere of sorrow, of anger, of revenge prevailed throughout Makkah. Moreover, Abu Sufyan had prohibited them from lamenting, from crying openly, lest that this would be a source of joy for the Muslims. So meanwhile, the tribe of Quraysh, they were burning with emotions of anger, with emotions of revenge. And one such person, Umar bin Wahab al-Jumahi, a member of the tribe of Quraysh, he sat along with Safwan bin Umayyah. Safwan bin Umayyah, whose father Umayyah, the master of Bilal, was killed at the Battle of Badr and they remembered the events of Badr and the losses that they had to incur in the form of the death of most of their leaders, most of the lives of Makkah, the precious lives of Makkah were lost at Badr. Safwan bin Umayyah and Umar bin Wahab, they sat together remembering these sorrowful events. And Umar bin Wahab, he expressed his desire, saying that I would definitely want to kill the Prophet wasallam. Had it not been for the heavy burden of debts that I have on my shoulders, which I have to repay, and because I am poor and I have a family to look after, had it not been for these two reasons, I would definitely go forward and fulfill my purpose, my desire, to put an end to the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and consequently to Medina, to the religion of Islam. Safwan bin Umayyah who was a wealthy person of Makkah on hearing this desire that Umar bin Wahab expressed. Safwan bin Umayyah said that, oh Umar, why don't you go forward with your plans? I will take care of your debts, I will repay them and also I will take care of your family. Hearing this from Safwan, Umar set out to Medina, taking along with him a sword that he had poisoned. On reaching Medina, he reached the Masjid an Nabawi. And all of this planning that has taken place, none, none of the people know it except for Safwan and Umar. Not even the people of Quraysh. This was a secret, a private matter between Safwan and Umar bin Wahab. After Umar reached Medina and he stood at the doors of Al Masjid al Nabawi, Umar bin Khattab who saw him in this attire, a person of Quraysh, after the Battle of Badr, standing at the door of Al Masjid al Nabawi with a sword. He immediately took him to the Prophet, وسلم, holding him, holding the sword that he had brought, lest he commit something that would harm the Prophet. Meanwhile, while all of this was happening and the secret meeting that took place between Safwan and Umar who were thinking that we are the only two people who know about our evil plans they did not realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from whom nothing not even an atom in this earth and the heavens is hidden from him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was already aware of their plan before they could even make their plans. As Luqman, may Allah be pleased with him, advised his son saying, Ya Bunaya innaha in taku mithqala habbatim min khardalin fatakun fi sakhratin au fi samawati au fil ardi ya tibihallah. That, oh my son, even if it were a mustard seed in the heavens or the earth or in the rocks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of bringing it forth. And Allah has described himself as Alimun bidhati sudur and Allamul Ghuyub, the one who knows even your thoughts, the one who knows the unseen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already informed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the evil intentions of Umar bin Wahab. Umar bin Wahab came and sat before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told him that, Oh Umar, be honest. And tell me the purpose for which you have come to Medina. Umar said that, O Prophet of Allah, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I have a brother of mine who is one of the captives 
in Medina. He has been taken as a prisoner of war in the battle of Badr. I came to visit my brother. The Prophet wasallam again said, Oh Umar, be honest and tell the truth for which you have come. And Umar was determined not to even reveal the slightest of the matters that was there between him and Safwan. Finally, the Prophet wasallam himself disclosed to Umar what he had concealed in his heart, saying that, Oh Umar, you have come with such and such an intention. You have come with the intention to assassinate me with this sword. On hearing this, Umar was taken aback. And for once, Umar bin Wahab al-Jumahi, who came to kill the Prophet wasallam, for once he knew that this information is a clear evidence of the truthfulness of the Prophet wasallam. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the true prophet of oh, Allah. So there is no way a person could know the reason for which I had come. And for once Umar bin Wahhab al-Jumah, he extended his hand and he pledged alliance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he bore witness that from today onwards, I am also one of the Muslims. He said, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. He embraced Islam. Not only did he embrace Islam, but this person who had come with Ma to Medina to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he returned to Mecca, calling the people to the religion which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was calling to, and he was successful in calling many of the Meccans to Islam. This was the incident of Umar bin Wahhab al-Jumahi, who came to assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but ended up converting to Islam. <coughs> Another significant incident that took place between the Battle of Badr and Uhud was the incident of the exile of the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa. We had seen earlier that three Jewish tribes, they dwelt in Medina. One was Banu Qaynuqa, the other Banu Nadir, and the third Banu Quraida. And we had also seen that a pledge was made between the Muslims and the, all of these Jewish tribes that they would peacefully live together with no one causing any form of disturbance to the other. And that each of them would help the other in case of the attack of an external enemy. This was the pledge that was already made between the Muslims, the Prophet wasallam, and these three Jewish tribes. The Prophet ﷺ tried his best to not go against any one of the clauses of the treaty, of this pledge. However, the Jews, especially the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa, from the beginning itself, they had taken the lead role in creating different forms of mischief in Medina, different forms of trouble and disturbances in the Medinan society. One of such instances, instances was that a person named Shaas bin Qais the from the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa he happened to pass by some of the companions the Muslims of Aws and Khazraj and he was surprised at the brotherhood the love and compassion with which these two tribes the members of these two tribes were living and he had in his mind those days of the war of Bu'ath whether these same tribes, Aws and Khazraj, were enemies of each other, were eager to take the life and shed the blood and eat the property of each other. He could not see these two tribes living in such a, such a harmony. And therefore he sent one of his youth that go and sit along with the Aws and Khazraj and remind them of the days of the war of Bu'ath, a pre-Islamic war that took place between Aws and Khazraj. And a youth of the Jewish tribe of Qaynuqa, he came, he sat with the Aws and Khazraj and he began to remind them of the day of Bu'ath so much so that the love and harmony that was present between the Aws and Khazraj, between this, this group of Muslims, it began to weaken and in a matter of time, it was as if that old emotion of hatred that old sense of enmity had been incited. The old fire of enmity had been ignited 
and it was almost a warlike situation. When the Prophet ﷺ came to know about this, he immediately came to that group of Aws and Khazraj, that small group, and he advised them. He advised them saying, O Muslims by Allah, have you entered the state of pre-Islamic ignorance while I am still among you? After Allah guided you to Islam, honored you with it, by it he cut the fetters of ignorance from your necks and delivered you from disbelief and united your hearts. The Prophet ﷺ delivered this short speech and again the bonds of brotherhood were strengthened and the same atmosphere of harmony, of love and compassion again prevailed in this small group of Aws and Khazraj who had just turned into enemies. This was just one of the incidents that shows that what forms of troubles and mischiefs the Jews used to cause in the Muslim society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also mentioned some of the actions in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about them in Surah Ali Imran and said, they used to say, Aminu billadhi unzila alayhi wajhan nahari waqfuru akhirahu la'allahum yarjaun. The Jews used to plot and say to each other that become Muslims, outwardly express that we have become Muslims and then after a short time return back to your religion. So that the other people, the other people who are yet in disbelief in Medina, they get disheartened to accept Islam. Because the people of Medina, they looked up at Jews as people of knowledge. Before the coming of Islam, before the coming of the Prophet wasallam, the people of Medina considered the Jews to be the people of knowledge. The Jews used this power they had, this authority they had, and this form of respect they had in some of the, the hearts of the people of Medina in order to dishearten them from accepting Islam. In order to stop them from accepting Islam, they used to pretend that they have become Muslims and after a short period of time they say that we have found nothing good in Islam and our religion, Judaism was better than this and they returned back to their religion. This was also one of the forms of troubles this, uh, they tried to make in Medina. One of the poets, Kaab bin Ashraf, he had crossed all limits in maligning the Muslims, in accusing the Muslims in form of poetry and also in instigating the people of Quraysh to once again gather for war against the people of Medina. And many such things were already piling up as complaints and accusations against these people of Banu Qaynuqa especially and against the Jews in general. And finally that incident took place which led to the exile of Banu Qaynuqa from Medina. And that incident was that a woman, an Arab woman from Medina, from the Muslims, she went to the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa, to the marketplace of Banu Qaynuqa, and she sat at the goldsmiths. And when she wanted to return, when she rose from that place, some of the Jews and that goldsmith himself, they fastened her garments. And we know in those days, in those days, they did not wear clothes like we have. They did have such type of clothes, but the other form of clothes which they usually wore was that they wrapped themselves up with large pieces of cloth, with blankets, with a thick piece of cloth. They simply wrapped themselves up and they went out for their needs. When this woman came and sat at the shop of this goldsmith, he fastened one of the corners of her garments and when she rose up, when she stood up, her garment fell off her body, exposing her. She was exposed. She cried for help. And one of the Muslims who was present there, he could not bear this sight and he killed that Jew who did such a thing with that woman. In return, many of the Jews, they pounced upon that Muslim and they killed him. The family of this Muslim, they came to the rest of the Muslims in Medina demanding help. That, O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Sahaba, help us, for, for verily we have been wronged by the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa. On hearing this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knew that this was a clear breach of the covenant that we had made with them. He set out with his army, he set out with his army to the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa. 
and he had already after Badr called Banu Qaynuqa to Islam after the battle of Badr was completed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had already visited the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa and had said to them that O tribe of Banu Qaynuqa accept Islam or else you will suffer the same fate with the people of Quraysh have suffered and but they were harsh in replying to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam they said that O Prophet of Allah do not consider us to be weak like the people of Quraysh when you fight us you will find us to be the most boldest the bravest of all people but the reality of them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already spoken about them in the Quran they will fight from behind walls they will fight from behind walls you will perceive them to be united while in reality their hearts are totally disunited the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after this incident he set out to their dwellings in one of the places of Medina and he laid a siege to their dwellings after a siege that was that extended to 15 days the Banu Qaynuqa they came out and surrendered to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul who was a disbeliever and after the battle of Badr he outwardly expressed Islam or in other words we call Munafiq a hypocrite who had just embraced Islam but outwardly in order to show that he is a Muslim but from within from within his heart he concealed kufr he was a kafir from within he came in between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa and he pleaded that O Prophet of Allah we had relations with the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa the tribe of Khazraj and the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa had been friends in the pre-Islamic days and I intercede that you spare them the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he forgave the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa he spared their lives but he exiled them from Medina because they had broken the covenant they were asked to leave their wealth and all that they had and they were exiled from Medina after which they went to the land of Sham to the land of Syria and then they were they they were lost their tribe scattered and there is no news about what happened to them after this this was the first tribe from the three Jewish tribes who was exiled from Medina these my brothers and sisters were some of the incidents that took place between the battle of Badr and Uhud and there are some more to come inshallah we'll look at them in the coming episode up till then I leave you in the security of Allah wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh